أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم dear brothers and sisters and welcome to another episode of the life of Prophet Muhammad we've spoken at length so far about the the Prophet's ancestors we spoke about uh, we spoke about Abdul Muttalib, we spoke about Hashim, and uh, in this episode, I'd like to speak about the events leading up to the, the birth of the Prophet and the actual birth of the Prophet. So <clears throat> we know that the Prophet's parents, his father was Abdullah, the, the youngest son of Abdul Muttalib, and his mother was Amina. Now to, to place their marriage on a timeline, we have a, uh, an excerpt from Tariq al-Yaqubi, uh, the famous uh, classical Muslim historian. He says, وَكَانَ تَزْوِيجُ عَبْدِ اللَّهِ بِنْ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ لِآمِنَ بِنْ تُوَهَبْ بَعْدَ حَفْرِ زَمْزَمْ بِعَشْرِ سِنِينَ he says the marriage of Abdullah to Amina took place about 10 years after the excavation of Zamzam. So 10 years after the recovery of Zamzam. So the marriage of Abdullah and Amina took place 10 years after the rediscovery of Zamzam. And one year after Abdul Muttalib uh, fulfilled his oath, where he essentially ransomed uh, his son for uh, the sacrifice of a uh, hundred camels. So just to give you an idea there um, uh, about the, uh, the timeline, when exactly the marriage took place. Now, Abdul Muttalib was around the age of 17 or 18. He was in his late teens. And after having fulfilled uh, his oath, Abdul Muttalib, you know, he sees that this is his youngest son. He was able to save him from uh, being uh, sacrificed by sacrificing those uh, those uh, those red camels. So he's Abdul Muttalib is now determined to get his son married. Now, Abdul Muttalib, as we know, is the chief of Quraysh. He is the most prominent figure in this tribe. And Quraysh is the most powerful tribe uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. So naturally, someone of his stature would have access to the, the, best, uh, to the best people, the most honorable tribes, the most honorable clans. So Abdul Muttalib, after fulfilling his oath, he's determined to, to get his son married to Amin ibn Tuwahab. Now, Amin ibn Tuwahab is also from Quraysh. So remember that you have the tribe of Quraysh. And then within the tribe of Quraysh, you have, uh, you have a number of clans. And therefore, Amin ibn Tuwahab, she belongs to the same, she belongs to the same tribe, you know, Wahab belongs to the same tribe as Abdul Muttalib, but they belong to, to different, uh, they uh, belong to specific clans. So Amin ibn Tuwahab is from the Quraysh, but she belongs to the clan of Zuhra. She's from Bani Zuhra. Now, some historians mention that when she came of age, when she reached the age of marriage, uh, her father had passed away. Some historians mentioned that her father passed away uh, before she got married. So some say that Amina's father had passed away and she was under the guardianship of her uncle Wuhayb. So her father is Wahab and her uncle is Wuhayb. Abdul Muttalib travels to, uh, to meet uh, this clan, to meet the family. He approaches the guardian of Amina. Some say that it was her father Wahab, others say that it was her uncle Wuhayb. In any case, you know, based on this report, he goes to her uncle and asks for the hand of his niece. 
Now, interestingly, the uncle, when he sees Abdul Muttalib coming to ask for the hand of his niece for his own son, Wuhayb, he agrees to the union. And because of how honorable Abdul Muttalib was, and, and everyone wanted to forge an alliance with him, you know, one of the ways in which you build alliances with other clans is through marriage. So he also offers his own daughter, his own daughter Hala to Abdul Muttalib. So you see that on the same day that Abdul Muttalib, that Abdullah marries Amina, Abdul Muttalib marries Amina's first cousin, Hala. And from Hala, this is the marriage where we see Hamza born and Safiya. So if you look at Hamza, Hamza was the Prophet's uncle through Abdul Muttalib, because he's the son of Abdul Muttalib because of this marriage that took place. And he's also the second cousin of the Prophet through, through Hala. So, so, so you see that there are two marriages that take place that have a profound impact on the history of Islam. Of course, the, the birth of the Prophet from Amina and Abdullah and the birth of Hamza and Safiya from Hala, who is the, uh, uh, who is the, the daughter of uh, Amina's uncle and essentially uh, her cousin. Now, Amina bin Wahab is not an obscure personality. She's a very well-known lady in the pre-Islamic era. And as I mentioned, you know, naturally, someone of Abdul Muttalib's stature is not going to just marry his son to anybody, especially considering that Abdullah was his most beloved son. He wanted to ensure that he marries a noble woman, a woman of integrity, a woman of class. So just to give you an idea of her position in the pre-Islamic era, Ibn Hisham in his Sirah of the Prophet, and for those of you who want more information about the, the primary and the secondary sources uh, of the prophetic biography, you can go back to, uh, to episode one where we spoke about uh, how to reconstruct the Prophet's biography. So Ibn Hisham writes, Abdul Muttalib hatta ata bihi wahab ibn Abd al-Manaf. So Abdul Muttalib sets out with his son, Abdullah, to meet Wahab ibn Abd al-Manaf. So again, some say that Abdul Muttalib meets the father of Amina. Others say that he was, that the father had died and he met with the uncle. In any case, that's not that important. And then he says, وَهُوَ يَوْمَئِذٍ سَيِّدُ بَنِي زُهْرًا نَسَبًا وَشَرَفًا Now what we know is that Wahab, who was the father of Amina, again, was not your average guy. He was the head of his clan. He was the head of Bani Zuhra. And you have Abdul Muttalib, who is the, the head of Bani Hashim, and he is the head of Quraysh. He's the chief of Quraysh. So you see that you know these are very important personalities, very well-known personalities, even in the pre-Islamic era. They're known for their honorable lineage and their nobility. So the guardian, the father of Amina, or the uncle of Amina, wedded Amina bin Wahab to Abdullah. Now, who was Amina bin Wahab? Ibn Hisham writes, وَهِيَ يَوْمَئِذٍ أَفْضَلُ مْرَأَةٍ فِي قُرَيْشْ نَسَبًا وَمَوْضِعًا The reputation of Amina in the pre-Islamic era was that she was the best of all women of Quraysh in terms of lineage and in terms of her own character and her own nobility. So you have this massive tribe the tribe of Quraysh, if you were to ask, you know, the Arabs, you know, who is the most coveted woman? Who is the most noble woman of Quraysh? Amina would definitely be 
uh, at the top of that list. Now, there is in Al Kafi, Sheikh Al Kulaini, he has a section in Al Kafi which is dedicated to uh, history, especially the history of the Ma'asumin. And Sheikh Al Kulaini, when he speaks about the Prophet's birth, he writes, and, and you can find this in Al Kafi, volume one, page 439. Sheikh Al Kulaini, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he says, ولد النبي صلى الله عليه وآله لثنتي عشر ليلة مضت من شهر ربيع الأول في عام الفيل يوم الجمعة مع الزوال. Now, before I read the translation, the dominant view among Shi'i scholars and historians is that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله was born on the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal in the year of the elephant. That's the majority of opinion. However, there are Shi'i scholars who believe that he was born on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal. So, you know, Shi'as should not, you know, discount or disregard uh, those who say that uh, he was born on the 12th of Rabi'ul Awwal because there are prominent Shia scholars who also believe this. One of them is Shaykh al Kulaini. Shaykh al Kulaini, he says the Prophet was born, and inshallah, uh, in a few minutes, I'll speak about why there is this discrepancy uh, regarding the, uh, the date of his birth. So, Shaykh al Kulaini writes the Prophet was born on the 12th of Rabi' al Awwal, which is the third month in the Islamic calendar, in the year of the elephant on a Friday, near the time of Zenith, meaning at the time of Dhuhr. And then he says, وَرُوِّيَ أَيْضًا عِنْدَ طُلُوعِ الْفَجْرِ Sheikh Al-Kulaini says that there are also uh, reports that mention that he was born at the time of dawn. And you, and you can you can imagine the, the metaphorical significance of the Prophet being born at dawn. You know, Zaman al Jahiliyyah, you know, figuratively we can say that it's a time of darkness and the light of Rasulullah enters this world. Now, uh, so he was born uh, 40 years before he begins uh, his prophetic mission. Sheikh al Kulaini says that his mother, Amina, conceived him during Ayyam al Tashriq. Ayyam al Tashriq, uh, we'll speak about uh, what this means. They're, they're the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th of, uh, of uh, the Hijjah. And uh, there's that uh, Sunni and Shia scholars are, there seems to be a consensus among them about uh, him being conceived. Uh, during Ayyam al-Tashriq, which are those, you know, they call them uh, the uh, the white nights where uh, the moon is full, Ayyam al-Tashriq. Near al-Jamr al-Wusta, in the house or the tent of, uh, of Abdullah. Now, as I've mentioned, the majority opinion of Shi'i scholars is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was born on the 17th of Rabi' al-Awwal. So that's the first uh, discussion here. Now, Shaykh al-Kulaini, Shaykh al-Saduq, they both believe Rasulullah was born on the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal, and this is based on a riwayah, it's based on a tradition. Shaykh al-Mufid, so scholars who came later, Shaykh al-Mufid, Shaykh al-Tusi, and most Shi'i scholars after them, claim that the Prophet was born on the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal, and this is based on two traditions. So again, we have narrations that mention both dates. Now, we have one riwayah that explicitly mentions the Prophet being born on the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal from Shi'i hadith sources. And the second narration places great emphasis on fasting 
on the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal without specifying the reason why it's recommended to fast. Now, some scholars say that the recommendation to fast on the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal could be related to Isra wal Mi'raj because we have a narration that mentions that it took place on the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal. Now, so it's important for us to know that even within among Shi'i scholars, there is a difference of opinion, but there's no doubt that the majority, the dominant view is the Prophet was born on the 17th of, Rab of Rabi'ul Awwal. And it's only a minority of scholars who say that he was born on the 12th. Now, Alam al-Majlisi, he actually points this out in Bihar al-Anwar. Uh, volume 15, page 248. He says, So he mentions the traditions that that uh, that mention both dates. And he says, He says, No, Sheikh Al-Alam Al-Majlisi, he says, No, that the consensus among 12 -er Shi'i scholars is that his birth, the birth of Rasulullah, was on the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal. The majority, and then he says, وَذَهَبَ أَكْثَرُ الْمُخَالِفِينَ Mukhalifin means our opponents, those who are not Shi'a. وَذَهَبَ أَكْثَرُ الْمُخَالِفِينَ إِلَىٰ أَنَّهَا كَانَتْ فِي الثَّانِ عَشَرْ مِنْ The majority of non-Shi'is assert that he was born on the 12th of the month, the 12th of the month of Rabi'ul Awwal. وَاخْتَارَهُ الْكُلَيْنِ And this is the view of Shaykh Al-Kulayni. Now, Alam Al-Majli, he says, he acknowledges that there are, we have narrations that mention both, but he believes, and the majority of our ulama believe, that the narration that mentions that the Prophet was born on the 12th was a statement that was issued by the Ahlul Bayt in an atmosphere of taqiyya. Because we know that oftentimes the Imams, when they, were, when they were asked questions, they would give an answer that conformed to the dominant Sunni view to protect themselves and their followers from being identified as Shias. So this is what uh, Alam al-Majlisi says. It seems that Shaykh al-Kulayni and Shaykh al-Saduq did not believe that those ahadith were uh, mentioned un under conditions of taqiyya, and therefore they presumably looked at the chain of transmission and they felt that uh, this narration is reliable and that's presumably why they, uh, they believe he was born on the 12th. Now, Alam al-Majlisi again, he, he mentions he says, And Alam al Majlisi, you know, he traveled the, the Islamic world. You know, this is not someone who was in contact with only a few scholars here and there. He spent, you know, a good portion of his life collecting the traditions of Ahlul Bayt. He met many ulama from all around the Islamic world, especially Shi'i scholars, prominent Shi'i scholars. He says, he, Alam al Majlisi, he says that the scholars that I met, that I came in contact with, based their actions, their a'mal, on the fact that his luminous birth, the birth of the Prophet, was on Friday, the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal, in the year of the elephant, at the time of dawn. So it wasn't at the time of Luhar, as uh, Sheikh Al Kulaini mentions. And Alam al Majlisi, he says that in fasting on the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal, which coincides with the birth of the Prophet, is equal to fasting an entire, an entire year. So that's with respect to the date of his birth. So again, to, to summarize, the majority opinion of our ulama is that he was born on the 17th of Rabi'ul Awwal, 
in the year of the elephant on Friday at dawn. The minority opinion is that he was born on the 12th of Rabi'ul Al-Awwal, and this is the opinion of Sheikh Al-Kulayni and Sheikh Al-Sadu. And we mentioned that we have narrations that mention both, but each scholar favors one narration over the other based on their uh, uh, analysis of the hadith. Now, we mentioned that there is a consensus among historians, Sunnis and Shias, that the Prophet was conceived during Ayyam al-Tashriq. Ayyam al-Tashriq are the 13th, 14th, and 15th of the Hijjah. Now, the Hijjah, according to the, the classical uh, calendar, the Hijjah is what? It's the 12th month of the Islamic calendar. If we say that Rasulullah was conceived during Ayyam al-Tashriq, which is in the Hijjah, which is the 12th month of the calendar, and he was born in Rabi'ul al-Awwal, that means that Amina was pregnant for a little over three months. So how do we resolve this problem? If you say, because it's, it's, there's a, there, uh, historians are unanimous in saying that he was conceived during Ayyam al-Tashriq, 13th, 14th, or 15th of the Hijjah, 12th month of the calendar. And he was born year of the elephant in Rabi'ul Awwal, which is the third month. So how do you resolve this problem? Was, the, was she pregnant with him for three months? Or 15 months? If you say, oh, it was the following year, so Amina was pregnant for 15 months. So how do we resolve this problem? Now, during the, the days of Jahiliyyah, and even, you know, well into the, the Prophet's, uh, towards, even towards the end of the Prophet's life, the Arabs had a cultural practice known as Nasiya, which is where they would manipulate time. They would essentially rotate the Hajj throughout the year. Some years they would... They would perform Hajj, they would commemorate Hajj in Muharram, and then they'd move it to another another uh, another month. So, when we take this into consideration, we can resolve uh, this problem. So, based on the practice of Nasi, and this they use the the Arabs during Jahiliyyah, they used to rotate Hajj. You know, one year they say Hajj is not going to be in the Hijjah, we're going to do it in Muharram. So they used to rotate it throughout the year, commemorating it in the Hijjah for two years, for example, then in Muharram for two years, and so on. So they would rotate it. They would always shift the Hajj season. This continued until the ninth or tenth year after the Hijrah, and you see that in the Prophet's sermon after uh, Hijjatul Wada, he mentions that this practice needs to be banned. This manipulation of time needs to be banned. And therefore, in the year that he was conceived, Hajj was in Jumad al-Ula, in the fifth month of the calendar. And therefore, if you calculate it, it would mean that her pregnancy was 10 lunar months. And if you convert it to, uh, to solar months, that, that places it uh, at around nine months, which is... Uh, the average, which is a normal duration for, uh, for a pregnancy. There is in Kitab al-Ihtijaj, Shaykh al-Tabrasi, he mentions the following narration. You know, when Amina was pregnant with the Prophet, she, she definitely witnessed and she experienced uh, some miraculous uh, things. We have a narration from Imam al kavun salawatullahi alayhi, our seventh imam, where he says, Inna aminata binta wahab ra'at fil manam. Imam al kavun alayhi salam, he says, Amina bint wahab saw a dream where she was told, Anna annahu qila laha, Inna ma fi batniki sayyid. She has a dream. In the dream, she is told, Verily, in your womb is a leader. 
فَإِذَا وَلَدْتِهِ فَسَمِّيهِ مُحَمَّدًا When you give birth to him, when you give birth to this child who's growing in your womb, name him Muhammad. So Imam Al-Kadhim is narrating from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, فَاشْتَقَّ اللَّهُ لَهُ إِسْمًا مِنْ أَسْمَائِهِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ الْمَحْمُودُ وَهَذَا مُحَمَّدُ Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, he says, God derived a name for him from among his names. For verily God is the praiseworthy, Allah is Al-Mahmood, and he, this child, is Muhammad, which means the praised one. So during her pregnancy, she sees dreams about what to name the child. Ibn Hisham, in his seerah, he reports the following narration. أَنَّ نَفَرًا مِنْ أَصْحَابِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وآله. He says a group of companions asked the Prophet. قَالُوا لَهُ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ أَخْبِرْنَا عَنْ نَفْسِكَ Tell us about yourself, about how you came into this world. Tell us about yourself. قَالَ نَعَمْ أَنَا دَعَوَةُ أَبِي إِبْرَاهِيمُ The Prophet says to them that I am the fulfillment of the dua of my forefather, Ibrahim. You know, when he made that dua after raising the foundations of the Kaaba, And it's mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah. So I am the fulfillment of the dua of Ibrahim. وَبُشْرَى أَخِي عِيْسَى And I am the glad tiding of my brother Isa, my brother Jesus. You know, as the Quran says, وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولٍ يَأْتِي مِنْ بَعْدِ اسْمُهُ أَحْمَدٍ Isa alayhi salam prophesized the coming of the final messenger. And then, so the, so the Prophet says, when, they, when the Sahaba asked the Prophet, you know, tell us about yourself, he mentions this, highlighting that, that I am someone who previous prophets were anticipating. They were praying for my arrival. And when my mother was pregnant with me, and he says, When my when my mother, not father, when my mother was pregnant with me, she saw light emanating from her that illuminated the palaces of Damascus. She, she could see visions of this light reaching Sham, which is, you know, to uh, prophesize how far this faith uh, will expand. Now, Narrations mention that Abdullah, the father of Rasulullah, died. The, the, the strongest opinion, the majority of the historians mention that he passed away before the Prophet was born. So he never had the opportunity of meeting his son, the final messenger of God. Alam al-Majlisi, he reports, about the, the death of Abdullah. فَلَمَّا حَمَلَتْ بِرَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ تُوفِي Allah in Majlis, he says that Abdullah died during Amina's pregnancy. How did he die? He was a very young man, you know, 17, 18 years old. You know, the maximum I've seen is early 20s, but it seems that he was fairly young, uh, late teens. وَذَلِكَ أَنَّ عَبْدَ اللَّهِ بِنْ عَبْدِ الْمُطَّلِبِ خَرَجَ إِلَى الشَّامِ فِي عِيرًا مِنْ عِرَاتِ قُرَيْشِ Abdullah was a merchant and he had traveled to Syria with a trade expedition. He went with a group of traders, a group of merchants to Syria. يَحْمِلُونَ تِجَارَاتِ They were carrying goods and supplies. 
they finished with their trading in Sham. And then they, they were on their way back to Mecca. فَمَرُّوا بِالْمَدِينَةِ وَعَبْدُ اللَّهِ بِنْ عَبْدُ الْمُطَّلِبِ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ مَرِيُّ When the expedition was complete, they headed back and they passed through Medina, which was called Yathrib at the time. When they arrived in Medina, in Yathrib, Abdullah became sick. So he stayed behind with his mother's relatives, his mother's relatives, were Banu Najjar and they lived in they lived in uh, in Yathrib so he stays there, he's sick and the narration continues saying so the merchants who were with Abdullah they arrive in Mecca and there was a place where people would go out to receive their family members who went uh, on these trading expeditions. And, and you, you can imagine it as like a bus stop or in the same way we wait at the airport for our families to arrive. Abdul Muttalib is waiting for his son to arrive. You know, his, his wife is in, in her final trimester. She's almost due. Everyone, people arrive, they get down from their, their camels. Abdul Muttalib doesn't see his son. So you can imagine how how worried he becomes. So he asks them, you know, what happened to my son Abdullah? He wasn't he with you? So the caravan of traders arrived in Mecca. Abdul Muttalib asked where his son was. They told him that he became sick, he was ill, and he remained behind with his mother's relatives in Yathrib. So Abdul Muttalib, he, he sends his eldest son, Harith, al Harith, to retrieve him from Yathrib, to bring him home. But unfortunately, when al Harith arrives in Yathrib, he finds that Abdullah had passed away, the youngest son of Abdul Muttalib, the, the husband of Amina, the father of Rasulullah, dies in Dar al Nabigha in, uh, in Yathrib. Now, now we come to the actual birth of the Prophet. So now Amina is a widow. Uh, Abdul Muttalib, of course, uh, Abdul Muttalib and his family, they all try to make sure that uh, Amina is being taken care of. Sheikh al Kulaini reports the following narration about the Prophet's birth. كَانَ حَيْثُ طَلَقَتْ آمِنَ بِنْتُ وَهَبْ وَأَخَذَهَا الْمَخَاضْ بِالنَّبِيِّ حَضَرَتْهَا فَاطِمَةُ بِنْتُ أَسَدْ امْرَأَةُ أَبِي طَالِ When Amina was in labor, when her labor began, she started to feel that she's going to deliver this child. Fatima bint Asad was with her. She acted as her, uh, as her nurse. Fatima bint Asad the wife of Abu Talib came to her aid and remained with her until she gave birth. فَلَمْ تَزَلْ مَعَهَا حَتَّى وَضَعَتْ فَقَالَتْ so, so Fatima bint Asad stays with Amina. So, so this is the mother of Rasulullah and the mother of Ali ibn Abi Talib together in the same room. فَقَالَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا لِلْأُخْرَى هَلْ تَرِينَ مَا أَرَى So one asks the other, as, as Amin is given birth, something miraculous happens. هَلْ تَرِينَ مَا أَرَى So either Fatima bint Asad is seeing this or Amin is seeing this. One of them asks the other, do you see what I see? فَقَالَتْ وَمَا تَرِينَ It seems that Amina was the one who was saying this. قَالَتْ هَذَا النُّورُ الَّذِي قَدْ سَطَعَ مَا بَيْنَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ The other asked, what do you see? The first replied, there is a light. I see light illuminating the east and the west. 
So in that room where Amina is giving birth to the Prophet, she says that I see so much nur, these visions of light that are that have taken over the, the horizon, the east and the west. The narration continues, فَبَيْنَمَا هُوَ كَذَلِكَ and this is the most interesting part of the narration. Abu Talib, you know, after... Uh, so when Abu Talib saw Fatima, it seems that she was going in and out of the room. When Abu Talib saw his wife Fatima, فَقَالَ لَهُمَا مَا لَكُمَا مِنْ أَيِّ شَيْءٍ تَعْجَبَانِ When they told Abu Talib that there's so much noor and we see so much light and something unusual is happening. So Fatima bin Asad tells Abu Talib about the light that she had seen. Abu Talib. Abu Talib says, look at the difference in the way that Abu Talib is portrayed in Shi'i traditions and the way that he's portrayed in Sunni tradition. In Sunni traditions, he's a kafir and he, he, he died as a disbeliever. In the Shi'i tradition, what do we see? Abu Talib says to his wife, Are you surprised to see so much light? Shall I give you some glad tidings? Shall I give you glad tidings? His own wife. She said, yes. فَقَالَ أَمَا إِنَّكِ سَتَلِدِينَ غُلَامًا يَكُونُ وَصِيُّ هَذَا الْمَوْلِدِ Abu Talib tells his wife that you're, you're surprised to see these visions of light with the birth of this child. Don't be surprised, oh my wife. You will eventually give birth to one who will be the successor to his newborn. That's... That, don't be surprised that this is happening because you will see something similar with the birth of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You will, you will give birth to the wasi of this child. So with that, I'll conclude our discussion uh, today. Inshallah, in the next uh, episode, we'll speak about the Prophet's uh, upbringing and uh, we'll continue our discussions about uh, his formative Years bi'idnillah. Thank you so much, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Ajil farjan. Any questions or comments? Assalamualaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. So why did the birth date of the Prophet not get established through the initial caliphs or through Hazrat Ali if this was disputed at the time? Why wasn't it settled? Yeah, yeah yes. Why did this not get uh, the right date become common knowledge much earlier on? Or how did the wrong date become known? Why did the wrong date become known? Again, you know, Re records were not kept very well uh, during the uh, the pre-Islamic era, so you have uh, you know you have so why was it why was it emphasized that it was the 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 twelfth as opposed to the seventeenth? Is that your question? Um, basically, because the question was uh, why did the date not get established um, earlier on, like during the time of Hazrat Ali uh, or Imam Ali, but uh, why why was that ambiguity lasting till much later on? You know, we have we have to keep in mind that a lot of the the hadith literature that existed did not reach us. It's possible that they they set the record straight and they mentioned this, but those hadith did not reach us. What we have is we have conflicting narrations. Some one narration says seventeenth, the other says the twelfth, and there's a discussion among the ulama as to you know, whether the uh, the narration about it being on the 12th was because of taqiyah. So we don't know. So we, we have to always keep in mind that a lot of the narrations of the Ahlul Bayt simply did not survive. So it's possible that uh, this was, uh, 
you know, this was mentioned explicitly by the imams of Ahlul Bayt. But again, you know, considering everything that happened after uh, the uh, the death of the Prophet, this, you know, the 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 the, the date of the Prophet's birth it does is, is not going to have the same priority as as the other issues that were uh, that had come up. And do we know how long after the uh, event of the elephant army invasion uh, that the prophet was born? Like how many months may have passed? It seems like it was the same year. Yeah, we don't, I mean, if if the prophet was born, it must have been, uh, so if the prophet was conceived on the fifth in uh, Jumad al-Ula, that means that it, uh, it it must have happened towards the end of her pregnancy. So she was presumably in her second or th- probably her third trimester uh, when uh, when the invasion took place. We don't know sp- exactly, but just based on the Prophet's conception. So the Prophet was conceived in the fifth month of the Islamic calendar in the year before the year of the elephant. So that would mean that at the beginning of the year of the elephant, he would be, she would have been eight months pregnant with him. So it, it probably happened within the first two months of the, the new year. Thank you. And uh, there's people who talk about uh, there being a conspiracy to stop the prophet from being born um, before. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that? A conspiracy to prevent the prophet from being born. Uh, people that would come out try to uh, assassinate his father or his mother, like Amina. Before um... we don't, you, you know, we don't. Uh, I haven't come across anything uh, that uh, that indicates that there was an attempt to assassinate uh, Amina or her father. You have to keep in mind that um, you know the the Jews at least were. Uh, were they, they had settled in Arabia in, in anticipation of the final messenger of God. So, I mean, no one knew, except for maybe Abdul Muttalib and Abu Talib, that the, that the Prophet would be born from Amin and, uh, and Abdullah. So they, were, they just simply weren't on people's radars. They just didn't know that the final messenger of God would be born from this marriage. So to, to argue that there was an attempt to assassinate the, the mother or the father, I haven't seen anything credible that would, that would pr- prove that. All right. Thank you very much, Sheikh. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for, for tuning in. And uh, so alhamdulillah, we made it to the birth now. And now, inshallah, I think we'll be able to move a lot more quicker because compared to the Prophet's Ba'tha and you know, his prophetic mission. We don't have that much uh, about his early life. I'll try to mention as much as we can, as much as I can substantiate from the uh, the sources, but uh, inshallah, we'll be able to move pretty quickly to the uh, the beginning of Islam. Inshallah. Looking forward to it. Keep us in your thoughts. Assalamu alaikum.